Welcome. We're the two teachers, and we are at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. We're about to get schooled. You're invited to join our political repartee, candid conversations about American government and politics. Today, we're talking with Chris Liu. Chris Liu served as an assistant to the president and served as Barack Obama's cabinet secretary. Chris Liu cut his teeth working on Capitol Hill and later in Barack Obama's Senate office. Later, he served a primary role in guiding Obama's transition into the White House. Now, it's time to get schooled. I'm not sure there is any typical day. I can tell you that it starts very early, it ends very late, it's very unpredictable. My job as the cabinet secretary was essentially to ensure that the White House and all the federal agencies were fully aligned on a day-to-day -day basis, that the agencies were never surprised by something the White House was doing, and that the White House was never surprised by the agencies are doing. And when you're dealing with the breadth of the, that number of federal agencies, you know, it, you could be dealing with a homeland security issue one day, a veterans issue, a defense issue, or some days multiple issues at one time. And so in my mind, it's one of the most fun jobs to have at the White House because you get the chance not only to work with wonderful White House staff, but also to work with the members of the cabinet. You know, people often ask me what my favorite federal agency is, and I've long since learned that if I want to have a future in politics, it's not a tactful question to answer. But I will say that, in general, the federal government is highly underappreciated. You know, the president, President Obama, often says that the biggest deficit we have in this country is a deficit of trust in the federal government. It is hard to imagine anyone's life that is not touched every single moment of every single day by something that the federal government is doing, for, for better or worse. And so I think it's incumbent upon young people to get a better understanding, not only of what their federal government does, but also the state and local government. Look, there is an inertia in federal agencies. Um, and, and it's an understandable inertia. You have people that have worked there for years, for decades, and there's a certain way of getting things done. You know, in most federal agencies, there's a relatively small number of political appointees. These are the people that are appointed by the president, by the White House. And you're essentially trying to steer a gigantic federal ship in a different direction with a small crew. So the inertia in federal agencies in general is against action happening. And it is it, uh, the interests of the president, the White House, to have as dynamic, innovative leadership as possible who push it in the directions that the president wants. Um, red tape can be anything from the ordinary rules of how things get done. Sometimes th they make sense and sometimes they don't make sense. You know, there is a way that ha things have to get done in the federal government. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example. If the federal government wants to go out and buy a new vehicle, a new set of vehicles, people say, well, there's red tape that stops that agency from buying a new set of cars. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that you don't want federal employees going out and buying it from their friends. You don't want them to get deals under the table. There are rules that need to be followed to ensure that the proper ethics rules and proper regulations are followed. So those are instances where red tape are in the interest of the federal agency, and it's in the interest of the American taxpayer. But don't get me wrong, there are plenty of instances where there are needless rules, that uh, needless forms that need to be filled out. Um, you know, if you simply uh, were two days past tax day right now, uh, you simply have to look at the, 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 the instruction manual for um, uh, your federal taxes and all the uh, backup materials that explain the federal rules. And again, I, you know, I'm not a tax ex expert, I suspect a lot of those are necessary, but I suspect a lot of them aren't necessary and um, you know, have an inhibiting effect not only on individuals but on businesses. The, the first and most important thing is that the president nominates the people to uh, run those different agencies. And it's not only um, the head of the agency, or if it's a cabinet department, that would be the secretary. Uh, it's probably the, you know, in a big agency, it's 100, 200 other political appointees. So he has, with his appointment power, the ability to set the tone in that agency. But beyond that, the president has the ability to set the budgets for those agencies as well. Now, obviously, in our system of checks and balances, Congress appropriates the money. 
But the president says, hey, this agency should get $1 billion versus $2 billion. And that reflects the importance. Those reflect the priorities of the president. So personnel and budgets are the first, th uh, first two things. The third thing the president can do is he can issue orders to his agencies. He can say that this agency needs to take certain action, that these agencies need to collaborate better. Um, and so there are a lot of levers that the president can push or pull to move agencies forward. Uh, you know, you can't work in Washington um, for even a day without seeing the impact of special interests. Uh, we often call them lobbyists, and sometimes they are lobbyists, and sometimes they're just interested people. You know, this is a democracy that we live in. Um, it is important that uh, elected members or uh, the White House um, have the full views of people that are affected. Um, but it's pretty obvious that, the, in my mind, the views of everyday Americans aren't always um, heard as loudly as they should in Washington. Um, it more often is the people, the, the, people, the, the companies um, that have the money to hire the high-paid lobbyists. Uh, and you see um, the policies of government being skewed in those directions. In our system of checks and balances, um, the legislative branch, Congress, uh, writes the rules, or uh, writes the laws, and the president uh, passes the laws. Uh, but agencies have fairly wide discretion in how those laws are implemented. Um, it could simply be a law, uh, for instance, saying that um, people have to wear seatbelts uh, while they're driving. Well, you know, what those seatbelts are like and what exceptions to those rules are, you know, uh, whether uh, uh, there are different rules for different cars or different, um, different rules for different people. Those are things that federal agencies have to interpret. And so they do what is, they write regulations. And the regulations interpret the laws that are passed uh, by, uh, by Congress. And, you know, we try to uh, interpret those laws um, as closely as we can to what the framer, the intent of Congress was. Um, but often, special interest groups, as we just talked about, aren't happy with the regulations that come out. They go to court and they sue, um, and they try to have those regulations overturned. Well, the federal bureaucracy has a uh, huge um, impact, a uh, huge judicial impact. Um, they can take both, um, uh, they can take enforcement action, both civil and criminal enforcement action. Um, the uh, Justice Department, um, is um, the main prosecutor for the federal government. They make decisions about going after corruption by um, you know, federal officials, even state officials they can go after. Um, they make decisions about going after different kinds of fraud. Um, they can send people to jail. Um, but there's also civil penalties that can be issued by federal agencies. You know, for instance, if there is a coal mine uh, that has dangerous conditions that might endanger the lives of the people that are working there, you know, the Department of Labor, the Department of Justice uh, can take action to shut down those mines or to impose fines or penalties until they fix those conditions. When we organized the, uh, President Obama's transition back in 2008, we had 77 days from the time that he was elected to the time he was inaugurated. And you can't expand that 77 days. He is taking office on January 20th, whether you are ready or not ready. And so transitioning an entire federal government, uh, not only the people, the budgets, the policies, is an incredible task. And it really is one of the more remarkable aspects of our democracy that uh, we have these transitions every four years, every eight years. And it is a peaceful transition, unlike other countries. And m more often than not, is a, it is a fairly smooth transition. That transition has become even more important in a post 9-11 world. Uh, because it's not only about transitioning the people, the personnel, uh, the budgets. It's about ensuring that there's continuity in operations, not only on the national security front, but on the homeland security front, um, so that those people that would try to do harm to this country uh, don't take advantage of that transition period. Well, I, I, I always say, you know, one of the reasons why I have my job is that I went to law school with President Obama. So uh, jokingly, I say, look, if you, if you want to work in the White House, uh, figure out who's going to be president 20 years from now and go to school with him. But what I would say is uh, work hard, study hard in school, uh, work hard 
um, be willing to start at the bottom. Uh, the, you know, Washington, uh, Capitol Hill politics are full of people who literally have started in the mailroom and worked themselves up to become a chief of staff of a congressional office. And I fundamentally it, believe that if you work hard, uh, you do the little things well, uh, you will rise up and your talents will be recognized. At today's Political Repartee, we've learned three essential lessons. Chris Liu taught us that the federal government is everywhere. Hardly anything we do goes without some sort of federal regulation. Walking down the street, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the federal government is ubiquitous. We also learned that even though he's the chief executive, the president has limited control about the direction of our federal bureaucracy. He gets to appoint the very top of the federal bureaucracy to implement policy, but it's a small crew guiding a big boat. Chris Liu also reminded us that one thing shackles, handicaps the federal government, and that is our lack of trust. Because of our lack of trust, a lot of red tape has been implemented guiding and regulating what the federal government does. Clearly, Andy, we need more trust in our government. We need to trust someone like Chris Liu.